Hello and welcome to the screencast on using R to do Monte Carlo simulations under null models. For this screencast we're going to use just a very 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 simple uh, null model for a comparison to linear regression but hopefully one of the points you'll get by the end of this screencast is that in fact this can be used for a pretty wide array of simulations and to really generate a pretty uh, wide array of nulls and that null you know what a null model may mean may depend a great deal on your specific instances even though we're starting with a simple one and unlike the previous screencast that we've done using Monte Carlo simulations where we we in fact just generated um, artificial or simulated data itself we're gonna start with some real data um, and the data set that we've been using. So we're going to read that in. We're going to read in the distillus uh, sex comb teeth data set that we've been working with. And we'll do all our standard sorts of things of reading it, it all in. We'll read it in from Dryad. Um, and then we're actually only going to use a subset of the data here. We're only going to use sex comb teeth and tarsus. So we're just going to create a, uh, a new data set with just those two variables. And we're going to remove any rows where either of those two variables are, in fact, have missing data. Um, and uh, we're, of course, as we've looked at this data set before, we know that uh, with tar tarsus length, if we're looking at the relationship between sex comb teeth and tarsus, we should really center our variable. So we're going to center uh, tarsus length here as well, uh, just using the scale command with center equals true and scale equals false, all as we've done before. Okay. So as a reminder of what was discussed in class, um, we'll review what we need to do. First, what we've got to do is, of course, fit a null model with the observed data. Um, so really, we're just estimating with the mean. In this case, we're just going to estimate a, a, a sample mean from this. That's what our intercept will mean, because that'll be the only parameter we're estimating it. But using those estimates from the, the null model, we're going to actually simulate the data, and we're simulating our response value under that null. So again, we're generating parameters under null and simulating under that same null model. What's different now, what we're going to do, though, is estimate parameters, in this case, not just the intercept, but the intercept and slope, under the full model using the simulated data, data that was generated under that null model. And we're going to repeat this a large number of times, store results and parameters that we would always do, and then we're going to fit the actual full model and compare what our estimates are um, under the full model with real data versus what our estimates are of those same parameters under uh, when simulated under null. And so you should think about what this is similar like and think about what our definition of a, of a probability of a p value is, and you should hopefully understand that really these simulations under null but fitting under the full model really is kind of getting at that that same basic idea for a p value. Okay, so let's take a look at what this function might look like, and and here it is, and this is hopefully well commented so everybody can can see exactly what we're doing. Uh, and again, like like the previous one I've I've written, um, the uh, Inputs to this function are the, the mo model that you're going to use. That's essentially going to be your null model, which we'll call dll.null. And we're also going to have to include the covariate that we're going to eventually want to fit, which is, this, in this case, going to be the centered tarsus length. Um, and as before, we have to, we will extract some, some uh, information from that null model. Uh, for instance, we're going to uh, grab the intercept and, of course, the residual squared error for the null model, which we'll use for the simulation. We also need, because we need to uh, allow for uh, variation in residual squared error because that itself is estimated from the data so we need to know how many degrees of freedom we have and this is all exactly as we did in the previous screencast and then we'll do pretty much what we did before we'll, we'll first simulate uh, generate a simulated value for the residual squared error allowing it to vary uh, according to a chi-square distribution essentially um, and then we're going to generate simulated vector of the response variable again under the null. So if you take a look at this what we're essentially doing is saying okay let's generate um, a number of a vector of simulated variables and the number of, of, of observations are going to be equal, equal to the length of, of your covariate so however many here there's probably 1900 and change observations so that's how long the vector will be and that deterministic part of the model here is just A because we've, we've, uh, we're modeling it under the null model and then with the whatever our residual squared, uh, our residual squared error is for the model, um, and uh, so once we do that, here's the part that changes. So we, we are fitting, we're generating the simulated uh, response variable under the null model, but now we're going to take that simulated response vector and model it as a function of our covariate. Right now, the slope, our covariate in this case, which is our tarsus length 
there should be no relationship between the two of them because uh, we've simulated without that relationship. But we're asking, even without that relationship, do we get any pattern? What kind of pattern do we observe? And in a simple case like this, as we'll see, it's not going to do anything interesting. But often you can have simulations where you're simulating under a sufficiently complicated, what, what you'll call your null model, that can produce some very um, interesting patterns that may look like you're getting significant effects even though they are, they are due to other things. So, and, and of course we'll grab our coefficients from this as we do before. So this is very much the same sort of uh, idea of before, we're really only changing a little bit of how we're doing, the, what we're simulating, uh, and that's just simulating under the null and, and how we're using that. But otherwise, in terms of what's going to happen, it's pretty similar. And so let's actually now fit under the null model, which we'll just call dll.null, and we'll also fill in, fit under the what we'll call our full model, which is just fitting uh, with uh, tarsus length as a covariate, or the center of tarsus length as a covariate. And we're going to also, for our own purposes, extract um, from the, the model the, the slope coefficient. Um, so this is under the full model. And if we take a look at it, our observed dot coefficient it should be 26 and, and change. So that's the slope of the relationship. So for every millimeter in, uh, increase in length of the tarsus, we'd expect 26 um, additional sex compete as we've discussed in previous screencasts. That's clearly a ridiculous number because you never have that large a range. Um, but we could just rescale this to uh, micrometers or we can just interpret this uh, in another way. But but uh, that's just a matter of, of changing um, the scale and making sure you're interpreting appropriately. And for the moment that's not particularly important. So let's just take a quick look at some of the parameters. We'll take a look at the, the, um, the estimates under both the null and the full model. And what we see, of course, under the null, we only inter uh, estimate one thing, which is the global intercept, and that's a mean of 11.15. And of course, we see that when we've estimated under the full model, the intercept stays the same, because that's measured at the sample mean, because we centered tarsus length. Um, and then we have the slope of the relationship. Of course, if we hadn't looked at the centered tarsus very, uh, value, the intercept would be quite different. This is one of the other advantages of, of centering data, as it makes uh, such things much more interpretable. Okay, the other thing that's worth taking a, a quick look at is to look at the, the amount of residual, uh, the residual standard error for the models. And so under the full, under the, sorry, the null model, the RSE is about 1.66, and under the model uh, where we've included tarsus length as a covariate, and this is for the observed data, it's smaller, as it should be. There should be less of the variation remaining that is unaccounted for. Um, and, and if we looked at the R-squared, we'd see an increase in that. Okay, so that's straightforward enough. So let's then um, do our simulation under the null. Uh, we could just do it once, like we're doing here. We'll just run it once, and we get an intercept and a value for our covariate, and that's just the slope. And, and uh, that's just one simulation. We know we're more interested in doing many, so we'll make our big N equals to 1,000. And just like before, we'll use the replicate function here. And of course, you can use the for loop if you uh, uh, choose to. Um, we'll just uh, transpose that matrix just for convenience of how we want to look at it. And then we'll, in this bottom line, we're just going to look at histogram of the simulated slopes. Again, slopes that were simulated when in fact there's no real relationship between the simulated response and our actual covariate. So we run it. it just takes a minute. And we get a nice histogram. And you'll notice here, so we know that the observed slope is 26. In the simulated slope, so we, the mean is right around zero, which is what we expect, and the real distribution, this is a thousand, for a thousand uh, simulations, really sort of spans range from about negative six to positive six, and most of the density uh, between negative five and five, uh, and really very close to, to, to uh, uh, having most of the mass really with, just within negative one and one, probably about 70% of all that probability, um, which is really what we expect under the null. And in fact, you could make something you could think of as analogous to confidence intervals on the slope, but of course, this isn't a real slope. So this isn't really the meaningful concept. It just gives you an idea of the range. So don't think of this as a true confidence interval on something, as much as just giving you an idea of the main mass of, of the variation under the simulation, which is sort of saying from really negative 4 to 4 is what these numbers are telling us. And again, please note that these are not the confidence intervals. So how do we use this? Well, if we wanted to, we could use this for lots and lots of sorts of things. But um, if we wanted to, and probably the thing we'd most often want to do, is to use this 
to actually make a statement about how likely is our observed slope of 26 uh, under, under simulations under the null. In other words, the probability of observing our data given the null hypothesis. And what we've done is we've simulated under that null hypothesis, so we have a very clear way of thinking about it. Um, so what we'll just do here is grab the, the, the vector that's just the simulated slopes from the simulation we did, and then we're going to calculate a p-value, and let's just take a look at what we're doing. We're going to say, hey, let's look at the length of that vector of simulated slopes where that value is greater than or equal to our observed coefficient. So how many times when we've done the simulation under the null model, is it greater than or equal uh, to what we actually observe? So our greater than or equal is 26. If you even sort of just think about this histogram, do we ever see any cases where it's greater than 26? No, in fact, it's definitely not. So that should sort of tell us what we expect to see. And then we're just going to divide all of this by n, how many simulations we did. And that's essentially going to give you a Monte Carlo approximation for a p-value. And we get a zero. Now, of course, our p-value is not truly zero because we, we did 1,000 simulations. So our real p-value, and please keep this in mind, is just going to be the number of simulations as 1 divided by the number of simulations we've done. So we can say that the p-value is uh, less than or equal to 0 0.001 under this sort of simulation. Okay, well, you know my feelings about p-value, so why would we want to use something like this? Well, there are times when you want want to do such simulations and generating p-values, if you're so interested and so inclined, are hard to get. And this is definitely one way of doing it for various sorts of models. Um, and the other thing, let me just sort of, oops, that, sort of apologize about that. There we go. Um, however, we can use this for lots of other parameters that we're perhaps more interested in. So for uh, instance, one thing that we'll do as a class exercise is to do some simple ideas where we have a somewhat more complicated null model than we have here. We already have some covariates included and ask, how does that model compare in terms of the amount of variance explained, the coefficient of determination for those models versus the full model that we're interested in? And we will discuss that in class. So uh, that ends the screencast here for simulations under the null. Thank you.